All right, welcome everyone. Good evening. My name is Lauren Williams and I'm Adult and Community Services Manager for the Columbia Public Library, part of the Daniel Boone Regional Library System. So thanks for joining us this evening for a conversation with best-selling author, Catherine Center. I'm very excited. Um, say hello, you say hello. Hi, <laughs> hey, hey, everybody. All right, so Catherine wrote her first novel in sixth grade. It was a fan fiction about Duran Duran and she got hooked. Um, her latest novel is What You Wish For and she is the author of eight novels now. That's the right number, yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Include, yeah. How to Walk Away and Things You Save in a Fire were both instant New York Times bestsellers. Um, and then The Lost Husband, which is now a movie starring Josh Duhamel, which hit number one on Netflix this summer. Um, she writes laugh and cry books about how life knocks us down and how we get back up. Um, and being in Texas without power or heat for a few days has definitely, I would say, knocked her down a little bit. So we're glad she got back up to be with us tonight. So um, welcome, Catherine. Do you want to share a little bit about your saga that you have? Oh my gosh, I've had the craziest week. I'm so excited that this is even happening because we just got our power back today. Um, yeah, I'm in Texas. Everything's crazy. There's a snow apocalypse happening. Um, and I was down in Galveston when the really hard freeze hit and when we all lost our power. Um, and I was on, I was by myself. I was doing like a like a writing retreat. I'm trying to finish my new book, which is due to my editor on March 1st. So I'm like, yeah, and I'm so close, you know, and I'm just galloping towards the barn and I'm so excited to finish it and get it out there for somebody to read. Cause so far for the past six months, it's just been me. Um, and so anyway, I was down there trying to get some work done and um, we, my, my mom has a beach house down there and that's where I actually do a lot of my writing. And um, because it was so cold outside, I, it, it's got these shutters, these sort of, she says they're plastic. I think they're pretty heavy. They felt like metal to me, but these, these sort of storm shutters that come down. And before I went to bed the night before the big freeze, I closed them all because I thought, you know, that'll be warmer, right? And it'll keep the pipes from freezing and, you know. Um, but when I woke up the next morning, the power had gone out, which I did not anticipate. Um, and everything's electric in this house. There's no gas um, at the beach. And so um, I couldn't make coffee or tea or anything warm. I couldn't like heat water for a hot water bottle. There was no way of warming anything. But the most terrifying part of it, and it was pitch black because all the shutters were closed. <laughs> it was so dark. When I got out of bed, I like ran into the wall because I couldn't see anything. And um, the front door in theory has a hand crank where you can crank that shutter open for fire safety reasons. But when I called my mom, I was like, hey, where's that hand crank? And she was like, oh yeah, that's downstairs in the storage room. You're gonna have to run down and get it. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I can't get out. Like there will be no running to the storage room. And that was when I started to like kind of freak out. I started to get this like Kristen Scott Thomas in the English patient kind of vibe uh, I was like I'm gonna die in here like I'm gonna freeze to death in here like it was really scary this the the temperature was getting lower and lower it was pitch black I was like I don't know how to get out so I finally called my husband and he um he started calling around on Galveston to see if there were any hotels that had open rooms and he found or he got me a reservation um, at a hotel not too far away and um, I actually climbed out a bedroom window um to escape and uh, it worked, it was fine. And I was afraid I wouldn't be able to drive where the road's gonna be too icy. I mean, we're Texans, we don't deal with a lot of snow. It's very unusual. I, I, as I was leaving the house, I went past Galveston Beach and it was just all white. It was totally covered in snow. I've never seen Galveston Beach with snow on it in my whole life. So it was very dramatic. I got to the hotel, their power was out, but they let me go in and stay in the room. It was totally dark. It was 50 degrees, there was no heat. But at least I wasn't alone, you know, trapped in a crazy building. And also they gave us all flashlights. So that night I, you know, the sun went down at like, I don't know, five or something. I spent that whole night until I fell asleep um, working on my manuscript, you know, by flashlight. It was all very dramatic. Anyway, the next day I drove home. I'm now safe and warm. I'm with my family and, you know, it's all okay. But it was a very unexpectedly dramatic week. To say the least, well, I'm glad that you made it back to where you have power so you could be with us. And I'm, um, I think, as I said to you earlier, maybe this will be fodder for a, a future book. And I, I do want to talk to you about your books and writing. But first, I, I want to 
talk a little bit about this idea that you have um, posted on your website about reading for joy. Um, you have an essay uh, that is it's about this idea is very librarian-ish um, because we often have patrons who'll come to the desk and they'll be embarrassed to ask for the book they're looking for or to admit what they like. And we, we are very non-judgmental. Like, are you reading? Great. Um, yeah. So yeah, so your essay, you say, um, when I talk about reading for joy, I'm talking about reading the stories you want to read rather than the stories we think you should want to read. Yeah. I'm talking about a process of desnobification, of letting go of the idea that stories exist in a hierarchy with literary fiction up at the top and all other types descending down toward embarrassing. Stories aren't a hierarchy, stories are a universe. And I, so can you tell me a little bit more or tell us a little bit more about this really beautiful idea and you know how it came to you and how it's been developing in your head? I mean, I, I actually feel like in some ways, figuring out this reading for joy idea is kind of like my life's work. You know, I feel like I've been thinking about these ideas since I was very young. When I was really little, I loved to read. My mom has a master's in library science. She loves libraries. She took us, you know, all the time to read to the library. We have tons of books growing up. Um, and I loved to read really, I think, until high school. And then for me in high school, reading really became much more about achievement and about impressing people and about reading hard stuff, you know, and about being smart and about proving myself than about fun. Um, and I actually kind of hope that maybe the generation that's happening right now in high school maybe has some slightly better options because when I was that age, there wasn't really YA. You know, there were sort of children's books. And then once you got past like the secret garden, you were, you didn't have quite as many options. You were moving into grown up books, but now there's a lot more stuff out there. So that's, that's a good thing. But what I found was that as I was going around talking to book clubs and hanging out with readers, you know, I started publishing books in 2007. And ever since then, like if any book club ever calls me and says, Hey, can we hang out? I always say yes. So I visited many, many book clubs and in the process of talking to women about what they like to read and talking to um, and sharing my own stuff about what I like to read, I discovered that I am really not the only person who had this happen. Like I really thought for a long time that it was just me, that I wanted to be a writer, that I took it all really seriously, you know, and so therefore I was only going to read Kafka and Camus and, I, and you know, because I wasn't going to read bad fiction. Like if you want to be a writer, you don't want to be a hack writer. You want to be a good writer. So I was reading all the really hard stuff. So I could feel like I was inputting all of this good data. But actually, no, it's not just people like me who wanted to be writers. It's like, it's a lot of people. It's really common. It's astonishingly common that, you know, anybody who loved to read kind of hit high school and, you know, didn't want to be reading embarrassing stuff, you know? So it was harder for them to give themselves permission to read whatever books they wanted to read. And I think part of it is that you, you know, when you're that age, you care about your elders, you care about your teachers and you care about what they think of you. And so you wind up kind of adopting other people's compass, you know, about what's good, right? What good is. And for me, my adult life has been very much about trying to figure out what good means for myself. And my definition of good fiction now at, you know, 48 is that uh, any book that lights your fire is a good book. If it is, if it has captured your attention, if you are flipping pages and you can't stop, if you're staying up until three in the morning reading a book, that's a good book. Like there's just, there's no other way to think about it really, you know? If it's working for you, it's a good book. If it's working for you, it's speaking to something deep and important in your own soul that matters, you know, that's meaningful. It's resonating for you. And that's all you ever have to do. Um, and so I have worked really hard as an adult to try to give myself permission to read any book that calls my name, you know, because if I, hear about a book and I hear about the premise and I think, oh man, I want to read that. I try to make sure I go and read it. And if I hear about a premise that doesn't sound good, even if everybody else around me thinks it sound, thinks it's like a really important book this year, if it's just not speaking to me, I don't do it. I also have a 50 page rule. Like if a book has not hooked me by 50 pages, I just set it free because life is too short and I am not a fast reader. 
you know, I, reading has never actually been super easy for me. And um, I, I was thinking about this the other day, actually, because my, my husband, Gordon, my cute husband, um, is he was the captain of the track team um, in college and the captain of the cross country team. And for many, many years when we were married, I thought that he was the captain of those things because he was really good at sports. I was like, well, you're a jock. You wouldn't know what it's like to be bad at sports because we're kind of like a mixed marriage, like sporty, not sporty, right? And um, he, uh, one day we had this crazy, very enlightening conversation where he explained to me, and we, we've been married for like 15 years at this point, but he explained to me that actually he's not naturally great at sports. And that's the reason he was the captain because he had to try really hard. He knew what it meant to try really hard, right? He knew what it meant to not give up. He knew what it meant to be bad. So he could see that um, experience from all these different angles. And I think I'm kind of the same way because, you know, there are people who will read anything, right? who their bar is very low. It's like, oh, is it made of text? I'll read it. I am not one of those people. Like I'm actually kind of choosy and things don't hold my attention very well. And so for me, I really had to give myself permission to read the stuff that um, is gonna light my fire and keep me interested. And, and because of that, I think it's actually made me a better writer because I have to, because I'm always trying to imagine the reader on the other side of what I'm writing, what's gonna hook them what's going to matter to them, you know, what's going to resonate, that kind of stuff. I'm talking a long time. No, that's fine. I, you know, this is, this, it resonates with me because I was an English major and I had that kind of hang up, like I read literary fiction and that's it. Like, that's what I read. And um, someone was put in the comments that uh, they love the 50 page rule and have ditched so many books. Some is it was just the wrong time. And that's another thing too. It may yes. be that Someday I will get to this book or it will be the right time for this book, but it's not now. And that's okay. Yeah, it's that's absolutely okay. okay. Yeah. 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 I, I do think that's true, actually. At different times in your life, different themes, ideas, problems, worries, you know, concepts are going to resonate for you in different ways. So like for me during the pandemic, I did not want to read anything that wasn't a love story. I just didn't want to. And I didn't want to read anything with too many villains. I was like, the world's got enough villains. I'm good with villains. Right. I'm worried about nice people making good choices right now. Right. And, you know, and you don't even necessarily always know what you want is the other thing about choosing books. Sometimes it's a really a decision that you're not making with your head. It's right. like a decision that you're making with your heart. It's like you just start a book and it's not doing it for you. Like you don't have to justify that. You can just say it's not working. And it doesn't even mean it's a bad book. It just means that it's not the right book for you right now. Right. And that's okay. Well, I just, I love it. I love, so I encourage everyone to um, go to katherinecenter.com, right? That's the yes. website yes. Um, and read the full essay because it's wonderful. I, I'm curious though, if that idea of reading for joy has led to the kind of stories that you write, because um, it, it, tell us a little bit about your, your, that idea and how, you know, how it's contributed to you becoming a writer. So that's a very big question. I could go for like six hours on that question. It's a good one. <laughs> Um, so, so as you mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, um, I did write, uh, I did start writing in sixth grade by writing fan fiction, right? And I mean, fan fiction didn't even exist back in the mid 1980s. I, you know, but we did it anyway. We, we kind of invented it for ourselves. And, you know, I was really, really miserable when I was in the sixth grade and I was really, really hard on myself. And I, I, I hated kind of everything about myself. Like I just sort of spent all day, every day, sort of making lists of my flaws, you know, and my areas for improvement and all the things that were wrong with me. And I was just kind of a disaster. I was super, super awkward. Um, and my mom, um, like one day my, my older sister like came up to my mom and like staged an intervention. She was like, you've got to take her to the mall and get her some clothes. She is bringing down the whole family, right? So it was very bad. and when we got this idea, me and these two dear, dear friends of mine at that age, we got this idea that we were going to write stories about meeting Duran Duran, and we were going to um, write them as novels, and we were going to cast ourselves as the main characters. It's kind of a horrifying idea in a way, because it's so cheesy, and it's so teenage girly, but I, and, and the, and the, 
we did actually write these novels and I do actually still have mine and it is up in the attic and it is truly horrible. Like it's so bad. And sometimes I'll get nostalgic and I'll go up there and be like, yeah, I'll just read a couple pages. And then I start to read and it's like, I'm chopping onions. Like my eyes just start to sting and I'm like, oh no, 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 I cannot read this. It's very bad. But what I love about that early novel and what I think is a theme that's gone all the way through my whole life was that it was fun. You know, it was joyful. You know, I was in a really bad place at that age and I really, really needed somebody to say something encouraging to me. You know, I needed hope. I needed some way to believe that even though I was currently a disaster, I might not always be a disaster, you know? And that's what that book did for me. I invented these imaginary world famous rockers who all five in the course of the story fell in love with me, right? That was the plot. That was the whole plot. And um, I had to choose which one to marry. Like that was the whole story. It was, and it's terrible, but it was also really encouraging, you know, and it was really um, joyful and it was really, it rescued me. It was my sort of first, it was my first taste of this particular magic that fiction has where stories can kind of save you. They can give you a place to go that feels safe and happy. They can also teach you things about yourself and about the world that are hopeful and meaningful. I mean, fiction could do a lot of things to you, but for me, that's what I always turn to fiction for, right? I turn to it for comfort. I turn to it for inspiration. I turn to it to kind of look for sort of the best version of humanity that I can feel inspired about. I'm not a person who likes to read books about serial killers. Um, I don't really want to read books that are totally apocalyptic that are going to rob me of all hope. Everybody's different. You know, if that's your thing, that's totally cool. But for me, I am always, always, always searching for hope and inspiration. I'm always looking for ways to feel better. And that's what, that's what I turn to fiction for. That's, and, and that's what I do in my books too. I'm trying to do the exact same thing with the stories that I write. So even though I am not still writing stories about Duran Duran, thank goodness, I'm sure Duran Duran is also relieved. Um, I am still writing the same basic kind of book. You know, it's, it's, it's books about people who have been knocked down by life, who are struggling and who are trying to figure out how to pick themselves back up, right? And they wind up being these, funny, romantic, um, we call them bittersweet comedies because they're sort of half tragedy, half comedy. There's hard things that happen. There's genuine struggle. You know, there's heartbreak, there's grief um, in the stories, but then there are also lots and lots of funny moments, lots of banter, lots of comedy, lots of goofing around. And, um, you know, there's usually broadly a happy ending slash hopeful ending. I mean, you don't always get everything you want at the end, but you get a lot of it. You know, you get a lot of what you needed um, so that you feel satisfied and good and you get to the end of the story and you can turn around and look back at the world with kind of new eyes and some new insights about how everything works or could work. So yeah, it's the same, it's the same idea really, even 30 years later, you know, still doing the same thing. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have a question. Um, okay. Lindsay, I'm going to have you unmute your microphone if you want to say hello and ask your question. Hi, Lindsay. Looks like it's still muted. I see yeah. a little thing at the bottom. I need to press the button. I've, sent, I've asked her to unmute. It won't let me. It won't let me do it myself. Well, we'll, Lindsay, we'll come back to you. Or if you want to put it in the chat. Okay. Well. Um, okay. So someone, someone has written in the chat. I feel like you're my soul sister because I also wrote Duran Duran fan fiction in the '80s, although I was in seventh grade. <laughs> Sadly, or maybe thankfully, I do not still have mine today. That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, my older sister has very explicit instructions that if I am hit by a bus, her number one job is to get up to my attic, find that manuscript and burn it 
very quickly. I'm like, don't go to the funeral. <laughs> like, don't do anything else. Do not go get a coffee, get right up there and burn that thing. Yeah, it's very embarrassing. It is truly bad. Um, but again, the idea of it was genius. To me, we saved ourselves, you know, that year. Yeah. Well, let's talk about from your earliest novel to your latest novel, your latest published novel, I guess, What You Wish For. Um, and for those who haven't read it, can you tell us a bit about the plot of the story and then tell us about the inspiration? Um, what You Wish For? Yes. Yeah. So What You Wish For is my most recent book. It came out last summer. Um, it's set on Galveston Island, which is actually the beach I've been going to my whole life. It's about an hour from my house in Texas, in Houston. And um, it is about, I wanted to write about joy. So it's really a book about joy and how we get it and how we nurture it in our lives. Um, so I actually, weirdly, unlike any other book I've ever written, I started with this very abstract concept. I was like, I wanna write a book about joy and how it works. Um, so it is, um, the little tagline for the book is that it's about love, loss and finding joy on purpose. And it's about a librarian, a school librarian um, named Sam, Samantha, and she works in this totally idyllic, beautiful, historic school on Galveston Island. Galveston, the city of Galveston is like this gorgeous historic Victorian city that has a complicated life because it's been like decimated by hurricanes over and over again, but it still has a lot of beautiful old timey architecture. So it's sort of set in this beautiful place and she works in this charming school that's kind of like the school we all hope our kids would go to, or that we, well, if we were gonna work in a school, that's where we'd wanna be. It's all about creativity. There's murals everywhere and butterflies and color and fun and whimsy. And at the very beginning of the story, I guess it's kind of a spoiler, but not too much. It's just chapter one. The beloved principal of the school dies very suddenly and they wind up having to hire a new person to come in. And the person they hire is a guy named Duncan Carpenter. And Sam actually worked with him 10 years before at a different school. And she actually had like a horrible crippling crush on him at the time. And uh, so she's very nervous that he's gonna come into her school. She thinks he's married now. And she's very nervous that he's gonna come in and just drive her crazy with love agony, you know, that she, that this whole crash is going to come crashing back over her and she's going to just be miserable all the time. But in fact, what happens is he arrives at the school and he's nothing like the person she remembered. He has totally changed. Um, he's gone from being this sweet, goofy, um, playful, loving, warm-hearted person to being this very tough sort of militaristic guy. And um, so part of the story is about her trying to figure out what happened to Duncan, like why did he change? And part of the story is about her and the other folks at the school sort of trying to band together against him because when he arrives, he takes this sort of beautiful, charming school and he just wants to change everything about it. You know, he wants to put bars on the windows and he wants to make the kids walk through metal detectors and he's got all these plans. You know, he doesn't like all the color. He wants to paint everything gray. So he basically kind of wants to turn their amazing little school into a prison. And so it's about this like community of teachers figuring out how to resist all of this stuff coming from Duncan. Um, I guess that's all I'll say, but it's, um, it's, a, it's kind of this story about healing and it's a story about what really matters. And it's a story about how people take care of each other and how people stand up to be brave in their lives. And those, these are all themes that I love to write about, but it was very, very fun to write about this beautiful little charming school. What was the inspiration for it? Well, part of it was I read this amazing book and the book is called Joyful. It's a nonfiction read um, by a woman named Ingrid Fatel Lee. And if you are in a, on Instagram, you can follow her at um, The Aesthetics of Joy. Um, and it's really fun to follow her because everything she posts is just joyful. So it comes through your feed and you're like, like you get these little bursts of joy as you're scrolling through. Um, but she was really talking about kind of the neurobiology of how joy works. You know, why do flowers make us feel joyful? Why do fireworks make us feel joyful? Why does color make us feel joyful? Like what is the, how does it work, you know, neurochemically in our bodies? 
Um, and it was such an interesting read to me. I, mean, I was just totally captivated by it. And to me, it explained a lot of things that I already do in my life. Like I am already drawn to color and I already love flowers. And so for me, it was just very personally validating. I was like, oh, this explains everything. So um, yeah, I just fell in love with the book and I was like a you know, total advocate everywhere I went. I was like, you have to read this book. Um, I talked one friend into reading it and she wound up buying a pink sofa for her living room. So it was very life-changing, but that was really it. That was the thing that I wanted um, to uh, talk about. I just, after the book was over, I just wanted to talk about joy. I'm sorry, that's my husband's phone is ringing and I'm just gonna ignore it and pretend it's not happening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I, I, I lost my train of thought. So, sorry, oh, but that's all right. So um, um, with, with your themes about joy and resilience and being brave, I know that you have a connection to Brene Brown. Like you're, I think you're friends with Brene Brown. And so how has she inspired your writing? Oh, man. Well, I mean, the biggest thing that Brene, so yes, I am friends with Brene. She lives in Houston. We live just a few blocks away from each other, actually. And we knew each other before she was famous. Um, and uh, she's just awesome, by the way, I'll just say. She's everything you would hope Brene Brown would be. She's hilarious and very wise. And, you know, it's just a, a treat to be around her. Um, and, you know, when I first met her, I read one of her very, very, very early books called I Thought It Was Just Me. And I just remember having like a really profound experience reading that book. It was like one of those books where you're just reading along and it's like, it's flipping on the lights for you. Like, you're like, oh, like that's why people do that, right? Like it was just very educational and very profound. And it was just one of those life-changing books for me. So I loved it. I loved her work from then on. Um, and I'm amazed at how often the things that she says and the things that I think are um, kind of the same. Although I think a lot of people have that experience with Brene. You're like, oh yeah, I was thinking that. And then you put it into those adorably pithy words. Um, there was one thing that Brene said to me early on um, and it wasn't to me, I actually went to go and see her speak at a thing. And somewhere in that talk, she said, um, it's not, let's see, I'm not gonna get it wrong. It's not happy people who are grateful it's grateful people who are happy. And, you know, this was probably 15 years ago. I had never thought about gratitude really. I mean, I knew that Oprah wanted us all to have gratitude journals, but I hadn't thought about it really past that level. And she was really actively talking about gratitude a lot at that point. And it just totally shifted my thinking and my perspective. And it was at a time in my career when I was writing books, but I was really struggling to kind of help those books find their audience. You know, I hadn't, you know, it's not like you publish your first book and all of a sudden there's a stampede to the bookstore and like everybody is like, oh, thank God, Catherine Center's finally written a book. Um, it, it's so hard to kind of find the people who are going to like your particular book, right? Everybody's different. Everybody's busy. Who's got time, right? So it's a very slow process kind of finding the readers who are going to like the particular thing that you do. And I spent years, years, like a decade, like a full decade, sort of looking for these people, trying to connect with these people, reaching out. And um, that, it was kind of a hard decade because really until you have found like a certain critical mass of people who like what you do, you're always kind of in danger of maybe having to quit, right? And get another job because you're not really like, you know, raking in the money. And that idea about gratitude was sort of my compass that kept me steady as I was going through that process. Because again, being a writer is very much a job where the ground is always shifting under your feet. Um, you know, it's a very unstable job. Sometimes you're doing well, sometimes you're not. There's tons of disappointment. You never know if people are going to like your new book. You know, there's just a lot that kind of moves around and shifts. It's not like you get tenure and then you're set, you know. Um, and so for me, like doubling down on gratitude, on this idea that I was, that was going to be the thing that was going to keep me steady, that no matter what happened, no matter if I got the thing I wanted or didn't get it, no matter if the book, you know, became a bestseller or didn't, whatever, um, I was going to focus on 
just being grateful that I got to write books at all. Like I was like, this is the thing I love to do. And I get to do this thing. And I'm just going to be grateful every day that I get to do this thing. And if we get to a point where I can't do the thing anymore and I have to quit and go get another job, I will be grateful that I ever got to do it at all. Like it was, I really doubled down on it really, really hard. And it was so steadying and so helpful. Like it kept me from panicking, you know, as you do when you want something really, really bad and you don't know how to make it happen. So yeah, there's, I mean, there's been a lot with Brene. She's just wonderful, obviously. I wish she were running the world, but um, but that that one really has been like a North Star for me. Like it, that one idea that I, for whatever reason, when she said it, I heard it, you know, just shifted kind of the entire emotional trajectory of my entire life. So yeah, big props to Brene. That was, that was great. Yeah, we have a lot of Brene fans among my coworkers for sure. Well, it makes me think of um, Happiness for Beginners, that book. I feel like you introduced, I learned a lot from that book about happiness. And now there's a lot of research about those podcasts, all these things about the science of happiness. But I, I learned a lot from that book. Um, and I think about gratitude in particular. Yeah, that book actually, see, I, re I actually read a huge amount of nonfiction. I just love nonfiction. And, uh, and I'm always trying to figure out how to be happier because I am not naturally like a happy person. Honestly, like I, I'm, I really kind of, in most situations, I just start with death and kind of work my way backwards. Like, it's hard to believe that about you. I, I am, I am by nature easily discouraged and super pessimistic at all times. Um, but I don't, but I'm trying really hard not to be right. And I'm just fascinated by people who who aren't that way. And I want to be hopeful, you know? And so that's why I write about it so much in my books. That's why these themes come up over and over. I'm trying to learn how to be better at that stuff. And before I wrote Happiness for Beginners, I read a book called Happy at Last by a guy named Richard O'Connor. And it, it was, the subtitle was The Thinking Person's Guide to Happiness. And it just, it totally grabbed a hold of me. I was like, oh, this doesn't seem so hard, you know? And then I couldn't kind of stop thinking about it. And when it came to time to write the book, I wound up incorporating a lot of those themes. Like he talks about this idea of um, trying every day at the end of the day to think of three good things that happened to you that day, um, which is somehow much less intimidating than trying to keep a gratitude journal or something. You know, just three, just three little good things. That's all you have to do. You know, just keep it very small. Um, so, and that has actually turned into a whole thing for me because three good things became something I talked about with my kids and it became something I was keeping in my own journal. And now I actually have a newsletter that I send out four times a year and it is called Three Good Things and I'm basically recommending good things to people. So it's, um, that's become a real theme for me. So yeah, I'm always pulling from a lot of non-fiction-y places. I'm very interested in human psychology and why we do all the crazy things we do and how we can do life better. That's what I want to, that's what I want to know. I want to do the best possible job of living my life. I'm very obsessed with this idea. So I, you say you consume a lot of nonfiction. I also feel like you must be a pretty good study of people. I, I always, the dialogue in your books, I feel like it feels very real to me. And a lot of the characters, I'm like, I want to be your best friend. Like I just, um, they're so warm and, and real people. I mean, they're vulnerable and flawed, but also, um, you know, they're trying really hard and, uh, but I, I feel like your, you know, your, your dialogue is really um, exceptionally real. I just wonder how you've, how you've come to that or if, if that's just comes with practice or how you, how you um, do um, That's a great question. And thank you. I, I, dialogue is my favorite thing on the planet. Um, I love dialogue of all kinds. I love listening to other people. Like I love, you know, um, overhearing other people talking. I, I'm a huge talker. I don't know if you can tell. Um, I love to talk and I love the rhythm of language and I love the way words fit together and I love the music of it all. And um, so yeah, dialogue is my favorite thing. Dialogue is uh, really easy for me. Not everything in story writing is easy for me. I struggle a lot more with plot and with figuring out what the shape of a story needs to be um, you know, there's so many big questions that you can ask yourself when you're, when you're starting a story, you know, anything could happen. It's really kind of overwhelming, really, when you think about it. I mean, they could go to China, they could go to Mexico, you know, I mean, there's anything could happen. And so then that question of like, okay, what's it going to be? 
is a little overwhelming at times. So that part I think about a lot. I overthink it. I make, you know, I read books about plot. I think about plot. I study plot. I pay attention to plot. I map things. I, you know, draw things. I make Venn diagrams. I do a lot with plot. With fiction, I never, I mean, with, uh, with dialogue, I never, ever even think about it. Like I never, it's just a thing that I just feel like I've kind of always known how to do. Um, and I think part of it is a little bit that my writing style is very conversational and that is intentional. Um, you know, I could have gone for a different sound, you know, I could have tried to make it all sound very literary and, and, and difficult, but I didn't. Um, and part of the reason for that is because I'm always terrified that I'm going to lose people's attention. And uh, so I work really, really hard to make it as easy for people as possible. So like, for example, I, I try not to use too many big words. And it's not that I don't know big words or like big words, big words are great. Um, but I just think if you've got too many of them, it throws people off, right? It keeps them from being able to um, be lost in the story. They're thinking about the words instead of just being in the story. Like my sort of great dream for anybody who's ever reading a book that I've written is that they almost forget their reading. You know, that, 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 the, that the process of reading kind of falls away and the story is just kind of blooming in your head. And so I work really, really hard to make it as easy as possible. Um, I will also say that the way that I learned how to write, the way I taught myself how to write was by keeping journals. Like I kept a diary from the age of 12, really from the Duran Duran years, all the way through college, 10 solid years, I chronicled every tiny thing that ever happened to me. And um, ad nauseum, you know, in, in these journals, I've got them all up in the attic with the Duran Duran story, but I wrote it all in my own voice, you know, in this kind of, in very much the same voice that I write the novels in, right? It's first person, it's very intimate. It's the way you would talk if you were like hanging out with your best friend and it's midnight and you've had a glass of wine. So um, I think that there's a connection there too that I'm always like, I try to make what's on the page sound as much like talking as possible, even if it's paragraphs. And I, I think I've spent most of my writing life trying to figure out how to get what I hear in my head onto the page in a way that when you see it, when you see it with your eyes and then take it up into your brain, it sounds in your head like it sounded in my head. And all of that is about like obsessing over grammar and commas versus colons and M dashes versus, you know, semicolons and what's it all, you know, what are the best choices to make the rhythm of it sound right so that it sounds on paper the way it sounded in my head. And so I think that process of obsessing over that voice component of it means that dialogue kind of got pulled along in that same package. You know, that like, I hear people talking in my head and then I just, I just type it down. It's like taking dictation. I just hear them talking and I'm like. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> well, I, I can't say I've had that experience of starting one of your books in the morning and then suddenly it's like four in the afternoon and um, <laughs> like, oh, I read the whole thing. So. <laughs> Which is, uh, as a reader, that's one of the most pleasurable experiences, I think, is just falling into a book and, and reading it in huge, long chunks like that. And it doesn't feel like work or medicine or anything like that. It's just, it's a story that you can, you know, ride along with. Um, that makes me so happy. That's totally what I'm trying to do. Hey, we have a really great question um, from one of our attendees. What is Catherine Center's favorite Catherine Center book? And <laughs> I'm going to ask, add, and why? <laughs> Oh my goodness, that is a tricky one. Um, you know, I love them all in different ways. I think that I've, I, I do think that my more recent books are, it's not that they're better. I don't wanna say they're better, but they're closer to what I really love as a reader. You know, I mean, for me, I have been trying to get better with each book. But for me, you know, there's all kinds of better, right? There's a million different types of better. And so the only compass you can really follow as a writer is trying to figure out what you love the most, right? So if you had a free Saturday and a hot cup of tea and a fuzzy blanket and you could just curl up with a book, what kind of story would you want to read? And that has been a very slow process for me figuring that out, right? Like like we talked about earlier with the reading for joy, you know, I I started out 
um, trying to write other people's ideas of what a good story is. And the older I get, the more, um, the more I am able to render what I really like. And so I think the more recent books, I love them better for that reason. You know, the past four books, I, I was at Random House for four books. Um, and then I left and I went to um, Macmillan. Um, and the four books that I've done with Macmillan are probably my favorites. Happiness for Beginners, How to Walk Away, Things You Save in a Fire, and What You Wish For. And those books are all kind of connected to each other in different ways. And that's been really fun. Um, I am also kind of partial to The Lost Husband, which was the last book that I did when I was at Random House because uh, it did get turned into a movie and I did get, um, I did get to go be an extra in the movie. So you um, did? I haven't watched it yet. That's exciting. So if you, if you watch it, it's on Netflix. So it's super easy to find. Um, if you go and watch it, there's a scene uh, where, um, where the main characters are at a farmer's market, selling goat cheese at a farmer's market. And uh, Josh Dumel is uh, sort of the lead actor guy. And then uh, Leslie Bibb plays the main character, Libby. And Libby actually sells some goat cheese <laughs> to a lady at the farmer's market. And that lady is me. And I'm standing there uh, with my mom and my son, Thomas. And we're all just um, super nervous <laughs> to be on set. But it was very fun. We had a great time. So I've, I've a lot of affection for that book too, since it sort of became a you know, it became a thing. Yeah, it's hard. This is like choosing between your children to ask you that question, but it is, it's interesting to hear. It's interesting to hear your, your I, I mean, I love them in, in different ways. Um, it, it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, but I, yes. <laughs> and can I also say, I am loving the book that I'm writing right now. That was my next question is, what are you working on now? If you can share, can you dish a little bit or do you have to? Yeah, you um, okay, so I, you will be the first people to hear any of this. Um, it doesn't have a title yet. It, I'm still working on the title. Um, it has a working title that I like, but um, my brilliant editor, Jen, like if she doesn't like it, then I will totally defer to her because she's very wise. Um, so I won't share that, but I, I'll say it's, um, when we first, when we were first talking about this story, and this was probably last summer, um, I was saying to my editor, as we were sort of looking at the big pieces, because you usually start with like, three or four big elements that are going to be, that are going to kind of make up the plot, right? And um, so we're looking at these elements and how they kind of fit together. And my question for my editor was, is this too fun? Like, is this too fun? Like, I'm nervous that it might be too much fun. And I think that's my literary training, like coming back to like haunt me, right? Um, but it is, very fun. And then I find like 2020 totally convinced me that there is no such thing as too fun. So basically this story is, it's basically the bodyguard meets Notting Hill, but set on a Texas ranch. And that's what we did. That's what we did. And uh, it has been so much fun to write. If this story is half as fun to read as it has been for me to write, um, it's going to be a treat for everybody because it's just, it's like on fire. There's just electricity on every single page. You know, there's banter and there's tension and there's people fighting, but in a really good way. And there's um, energy. And, and, I, and that thing that you just described where you said, um, you know, sometimes you'll open it up and then half the day is gone. I'm having that with this book that I'm writing myself. So like, I'll go in to do some editing. I'm like, oh, I need to fix that scene. And then suddenly it's like 30 pages later and I'm just reading. Like I forgot to stop and go do something else that I needed to do for the manuscript. So I feel like that's a really good sign. I just keep getting lost in the story. I can't seem to stay focused on the editing part of it because I'm having so much fun reading. It's amazing. Yeah, it's and fun. It's really fun. I'm very excited about it. And I just, I, you know, it's all a lot of delayed gratification in the publishing world. I will turn it in in March and I don't think it'll come out until the summer of 2022. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's like a long process to get everything set up and get it all. It's not just printing, but it's marketing and sort of all the things that need to happen. But I will also mention that I, I did another fun thing just recently that's gonna come out this summer um, and it's a short story. So, um, I, so What You Wish For is my most recent book with Macmillan 
And it is connected to the first book I wrote for Macmillan, which was called Happiness for Beginners. And in Happiness for Beginners, the main character, Helen, has a younger brother named Duncan, who's super annoying, Duncan Carpenter. And fast forward 10 years, and he's the main character, one of the two main characters in What You Wish For. Um, and so I, I fell in love with Duncan when I was writing that first book, and I just decided that I wanted to give him a story, right? And I was kind of I was kind of biding my time waiting for the right story to come along and then this one did. And um, the paperback of What You Wish For is coming out this summer. And one of the options that, um, that I had with other books that I've written is to have a little bit of bonus material at the back of the paperback. And so I got this idea that I could write a story as an extra in the paperback. And the story I decided I wanted to write was not about characters from what you wish for, but about the two characters from Happiness for Beginners, Helen and Jake, who kind of find each other and fall in love during this story. Um, I wanted to write the story of the first day they met. So the first day that Helen and Jake met, years and years ago, um, Jake was 16 and Helen was like 26 and it was her wedding day and she was marrying someone else and Jake saw her in her wedding gown. Like the first time he ever saw her, he was crashing her wedding um, with Duncan and he saw her in her wedding gown and he instantly fell in love with her forever, basically. And um, so I wrote a short story that tells the, the whole story of that night and the time that they wound up spending together and how that night shook down. And I think it's the best thing I've ever written. Um, it's so delicious and it's so swoony and it's so charming and these people are so likable and I don't know it it, it took me over I didn't even actually have permission to write it when I wrote it like I hadn't talked to my editor and said hey here's an idea I just started thinking about this this day this day of the wedding and I just just started writing and it took me about a week and I wrote this beautiful beautiful story so it's going to be at the end of the paperback of what you wish for. And um, I'm, I'm so excited about it. I hardly know what to do. <laughs> well, we all need more delicious and swoony. I'm excited about that. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's we have a question from one of our attendees. Are any of your other books in the process of becoming movies? Have you had any other inquiries? Ah, well, I'm sworn to secrecy about some of those things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, Hollywood is very secretive, which is fascinating because like, honestly, like if I get a pedicure, I'm putting it on Instagram. Like I talk about everything that happens. I, so y'all should follow me on Instagram um, because I'm constantly posting pictures of like, here's my half finished manuscript. You know, here's a sentence I just wrote. Like I'm keeping everybody up to date, day by day. But Hollywood is the opposite of that. They don't want anybody to know what they're up to until they are ready to release it in their own particular way so whenever like especially with the lost husband as that was happening i would get these updates you know from the production company and they'd be like all right we're going to tell you this but you can't tell anyone if you tell anyone the deal is off and um so i got very good at like holding it all in so um there may or may not be some things afoot all right we will <laughs> we will keep our mouths shut and uh just and pay attention um so yes, thank let you. Us know, thank yeah. you. That uh, The Lost Husband, also, you can check it out from your library um, via Hoopla, our, uh, one of our downloadable and streaming services that you can um, can watch it. So you can do that as well if you don't have Netflix, which is very exciting. Were you very involved in the script of that movie? Nope, nope. Just nothing, kind of nothing. here you go. And yeah, nothing. The, direct, the woman who directed it um, also did the screenplay. Um, and that was very trippy because, you know, a novel is like, it's a good 300, 350 pages for a sort of standard novel, mine are. And um, a, a screenplay is about 90 pages. And screenplays also typically um, have a huge amount of white space in them. So, you know, a novel is a dense 350 and a screenplay is a very, very airy 90. And the rule on screenplays is that typically about one page of um, script equals about one minute of screen time. So, you know, you don't want it to be too long. You know, you couldn't write a 200 page script. Nobody would ever sit that long to watch it, right? So she had to, it basically, and this is why 
the book is always better than the movie. This is the reason. It's because you have to take this big complex thing and you have to shrinky dink it down, right? Into this tiny little compact shape. And so you, you're cutting out subplots and you're cutting out characters and you're just trying to reduce it, reduce it. And I think they did a great job with The Lost Husband. I mean, they did cut out a bunch of subplots, but they kind of distilled it down to the essential story. And um, so it was all fine, but I had nothing to do with any of it. I just sat back and was like, good luck. Thank you. This is very exciting. So I was pleased it turned out as well as it did. Um, we have a, just a comment from someone who says, I want just want to let you know how much I appreciate your enthusiasm in describing why and how you write. And I also enjoy that very much. Um, do you have advice for people who might be writers themselves who are part of our audience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you should write for joy. You know, in the same way I think people should read for joy, I think people should write for joy. You should write for fun. Um, you should write because it makes you happy to write. And I think that if you are, you know, we're all taught to be so critical of ourselves, right? We're all just trained in that year in and year out to find all the things we're doing wrong and to be so hard on ourselves. And I think with something like writing, the only way to hold on to it and to keep doing it is to make it fun because it is really, it's not easy to make it as a writer. Um, and it is one of those crazy jobs where the ground is always shifting under your feet. And so the only thing that you can really hold on to in that process is, is joy, right? Is, is fun, is pleasure. And so first of all, I think if you're going to write, and if you're going to do any creative thing, you know, if you want to be a juggler or a dancer or a singer, you have to learn the art of self encouragement. And this is something I was not born being good at. I've gotten much better and you can learn it. It is learnable, um, but you have to learn to look at what you've written and go back through it. And instead of looking for all the stuff that's wrong and beating yourself up about that stuff, you need to look for the stuff that's working. You know, you need to look for the stuff you're excited about because um, if you pick on yourself too much, if you're too hard on yourself, you're not gonna keep going. And the only way to keep going is to love doing it. And the only way you're gonna love doing it is if it makes you feel good. And you are the person who gets to decide if your writing makes you feel good. Because in anything that you write, there's gonna be stuff that's working and there's gonna be stuff that's not working. And if you only look at the stuff that's not working and you're super hard on yourself, you're gonna get discouraged and you're not gonna keep going. So um, yeah, so I, you know, I mean, when you hear me talking about uh, my stories, like I have been just now, and like being like, oh, it's amazing. I've written this amazing thing. Like that's kind of on purpose. Um, I'm trying to encourage myself and encourage others to just be excited about what you're doing. You know, believe in what you're doing, own it, right? And uh, that's the way to not give up on yourself. I think when you are writing or doing any creative thing, the world kind of really wants you to give up on yourself. And um, the way to not do that is to make yourself happy with it first, right? To write the stories that you love um, or the essays that you love or the poems that you love, find what you love and teach yourself how to do that thing, right? So that's my, that's my best advice for writing is to write for joy and to write all the time, like keep journals, you know, memorize song lyrics, um, read books of poetry, read the stories that you love, read the novels that you love, right? Don't just read novels that you think are impressive, um, but just read stuff that like speaks to you because that's how you figure out who you are. And um, I know a lot of writers who are always trying to figure out what the trends are so they can write towards the trends of like what's hot in fiction now or things like that. But for me, um, that's a very unstable way to go about it. I think the way to, um, to manage your life, if you're trying to do an unstable thing like writing is to get really, really centered and to um, figure out who you are and what you love and then do that thing. Okay, and one more thing, one more thing. The other thing I will say that I have learned as an adult that I did not know when I was younger is that um, the best way to write is to write in the spirit of service for other people. So when I was younger, 
Um, and I was writing, I, I feel like I was kind of like a seal with like a ball on my nose, you know, and I wanted, I wanted, wanted everybody to be like, Hey, you can do a thing. And it was, I was trying to prove myself and I was younger and I, I get that that's okay. Um, but, but what has happened to me as I've gotten older and older is that I no longer think of it as something that is about me. I no longer think of it as something that I, I actually don't even like, if you read a Catherine Center book, I don't necessarily want you to even be thinking about me when you get to the end of it. I want you to go through this experience with these characters and I want you to empathize with them so hard and so intensely that you almost feel like you kind of step into their lives and kind of become them, kind of like merge with them. So it's not even like you're walking through the story like near them or next to them. You're kind of going through the story like as them, you know, and the things that they're feeling, you're feeling those things too. And the things that they want, you want those things too, right? And the the um, kiss that they're longing for, you want that kiss too. And uh, it's like, it's you, right? It's It's them, but it's also you. And that when you get to the end of the story, you are able to kind of turn around and look at your own life and the experience that you just had and the lessons that you pulled out of that story with new eyes. And so um, I don't want you to get to the end of the story and think, oh, you know, Catherine Center really knows a lot of big words, right? Or whatever. Like, you know, I, I don't want you to, I mean, you can think about me and you can say, that was a great book and I'm going to go tweet about it. But you can also, um, like what I really wanna do is give you the experience that I wanna have. And so when I read a really amazing book, I get so excited because I'm like, I wanna figure out how to do that for other people. I wanna put more of that into the world and be a purveyor of that, whatever that goodness is. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's another way to think about stories is that you're trying to, if you can learn all these tools and you can get good at this stuff and you can figure out what you love, then you can do this really magical, life-changing, inspiring thing for other people. And like, to me, in the end, that's the crux of it. Like, that's the thrill of getting to write a really good story is that you've just given people this, this life-changing gift, you know? And you've given it to yourself too. You know, when you write a story that you love, you can go back and reread that story. <laughs> and I, I do actually do that. I was just rereading How to Walk Away just the other day. And, and like all the things about it that resonated for me that I was hoping would resonate for other people still resonate for me. So, yeah. That's, That's a great a answer. And I have to say, I haven't heard anyone else talk about writing in that way in service of others. And I think there's also this myth around like the depressed writer or the or artist, you know, that the artist has to be tortured and sad and have been traumatized in some way to then bring that to the page or the painting or whatever. And I really like this idea that's kind of an antidote to that. You know, for me, stories really, really are about healing and about nourishment. That's what I'm interested in with stories. I'm interested in the ways that people heal, the way they pick themselves up after life has knocked them down, the way that they deal with misconceptions about who they are and what really matters. Like to me, that's what stories are for in my life. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I, I really see um, stories if used the way I want them to be used um, in my life, you know, they are very much about, about healing and about nourishment. We have a question from Jane. I'm gonna unmute, Hi, ask you to unmute Jane and you can ask your question. Still see that little red mute thing down. Too. <laughs> I'm sort of wondering if it's something I did in the setup that's not allowing people to unmute. Mm. Well, can you ask, tell us again, um, the name and author of the book about joy that you mentioned earlier? Yes, uh, the book is called um, Joyful. Um, and Oh, it's got a subtitle that I'm going to forget, but it's something like the power of, this is wrong, but it's like the power of common things to create uncommon happiness or something like that. Um, and the author's name is Ingrid Fittell, and it's F-E-T-E-L-L, -L, I think, and then Lee, L-E-E. -E. Um, and she is very fun to follow on Instagram, and she's got a mailing list that's very bright and colorful, as you can imagine. Um, and the book is just, it's just yummy. It's just a really fun read. 
I found it. I'm going to put the put the title here in the chat. Joyful, the surprising power of ordinary things to create extraordinary happiness. That's it. Oh, great. Um, um, I was very obsessed with this book for like a year. So I know we're, we are running over time, but I just, I'm going to let you answer one more question. Do you have a writing routine and do you find the isolation of writing difficult? Oh, um, I, well, no. Um, <laughs> I'm not a very organized or regimented person. I'm a totally random person. We have a family joke that if you could like open up the side of my head and look in there, it would be like a tornado going around with like a cow flying by and like a grand piano and like some chickens. Like it's not, there's not a lot of organization. Um, different writers are different, of course. You know, there are people who sit down with their outlines and they have a time and they, you know, yeah, I'm not that person. Um, I mostly write, um, what, what guides my writing really is like obsession, honestly. So like I'll get a story idea and I can't not think about that story idea. And I get so excited about that story idea. And um, so uh, the way that I have structured my writing life, because I've, I've kids, I have two teenagers. Um, and uh, so, you know, that idea that I used to have when I was younger, that I was gonna wake up in the morning quietly, you know, have a cup of coffee, sit down at my desk and, and write things, you know, with my servants bringing me toast on racks. Um, that is not how it is, right? Like I get up in the morning, I'm frantically helping people pack their lunches and find all of their sports gear and get out the door. It's just none of that is really happening. Um, so what I've taken to doing um, in the past decade is um, when I have a deadline, um, and especially when I'm writing a first draft, I go down to Galveston. My mom, I'm very lucky because my mom has this little beach house. It's more of a shack, um, but it's sunny and it's, you know, clean. And uh, I go down there for like four or five days at a time. And um, when I am not interrupted and I don't have to worry about, you know, carpool or orthodontist appointments or other things, making dinner, whatever, all pleasant things, all fine things. But when I don't have to stop, I can build this incredible momentum. So I'll go down to Galveston, I'll go to bed, I'll wake up in the morning and make a pot of coffee and I will start writing. And before I know it, it's pitch black outside. And I've been writing all day long and I've got 50 pages and I, my head has just been elsewhere. Like I just wasn't even, I didn't even notice time passing. And so I will do that, you know, when I have a first draft to kind of lay out, because for me, the first draft is always the hardest part because it's these huge decisions about what's going to happen in the story, right? Like I think of it, the story has to have like things happening on the micro level, like the details of the scene and the, and the language and the dialogue and the tiny little moments that has to be working, but then it also has to be working on a macro level. And the macro level is basically like the shape of the roller coaster. You know, like, are we gonna do a loop-de-loop? -loop? Are we gonna go up high and stay there? Like, what's what's the shape of it gonna be? And the shape of it's always the hardest part to me and it requires the most concentration. So I will, when I have a first draft that I need to write, I will go down to Galveston probably five or six times for four days at a time. And I will just write and I will just keep adding pages, slowly making my way towards sort of 300, which is my magic number. Um, and then I'm technically done when I've gotten to 300, even if I haven't written the ending, I'm done. I've made it to, I've got the bulk of it. And then once I've done that, I don't really need to isolate myself at that level anymore because um, the rest of it is just kind of, it's just editing, it's just messing around with things, it's moving stuff, it's playing with the language. Once I've got the hard part done, then I can kind of relax. And that stuff I can do in the carpool line. I mean, that's much easier. Um, so yeah, so I don't, you know, it's different every book, just depending on when I can snatch those blocks of time. Um, and, you know, and again, I think everybody's different. There are some people that just need a schedule and need to kind of do the same thing every day. Um, I have many, many days when I'm not writing at all. Um, and, but then, but then when I am writing, it's like the only thing I want to think about. It's the only thing I want to talk about, you know, and that's just, that's like just sort of who I am specifically as a person. Like I fall in love with things. I just get really excited about things. I get very obsessed with things. And for me, it is much better if I can turn that obsession towards something really fun, like a delicious love story 
than something like, oh my God, the pandemic, right? Like, like steering my brain over to something that is something to look forward to and that's something that's positive is very healthy and nourishing for me. So I'm glad, you know, so like I've kind of made peace with this tendency to be very obsessive because I just channel it. I channel it into getting work done. Um, how do I deal with the isolation was the second part of that question. I know I've been talking a long time. Um, <laughs> it does not feel like isolation when I'm writing because all of those people feel so real to me that I don't notice it really, um, which is a little bit maybe worrying, sort of. Um, I, uh, I will say there comes a point when I've been down in Galveston for like four or five days when um, I will start like talking to like the appliances in the kitchen because I've been alone too long, you know, or like I'll drop like a piece of cheese on the floor and I'll like apologize to the piece of cheese because I just haven't spoken to anyone in a long time. Um, so that's not always good. Um, that's when I know it's time to go home. But uh, it doesn't feel like isolation when I'm writing because I am in such a delicious and blissful state of flow that um, I don't feel lonely. And I am a person who actually does feel lonely pretty easily. Um, so in, in the real world, it's very easy for me to feel lonely. If you send me into a cocktail party and I don't know anybody, I will feel lonely like before I even get there. I'll be like, ugh. But, um, but with my imaginary people, like saying funny things, it, just hanging out with them and just listening to them, I, I, it does not feel isolating. Um, so that's the answer to that question. That's a great answer. Well, we, we've run over time and um, you have been so generous in your sharing your stories with us and this has been delightful i do uh, we we have one final question you do have to answer okay who did you marry in the duran duran novel and, <laughs> and uh this is from spencer by the way my spouse i bet it was john taylor it was not john taylor he was taken um by one of my other friends julie alonzo who spencer also knows lauren and spencer and i know each other from way back i went to high school with lauren's husband we never talked about this i know <laughs> hi spencer um so uh it was simon Le bon. Of course. You know, I mean, for me, it was just, I can't even tell you. John Taylor is still adorable to this day and was doing lots of fun, cute stuff on Facebook during the pandemic. But yeah, for me, it was, it was Simon. All right. Well, I, I'm, that, I'm glad that mystery is solved. Um, <laughs> this, this has been so fun. You are just charming and wonderful and I could talk to you all night. Um, will you come back and talk to us again when your next novel comes out or before? Anytime, anytime. Like seriously, okay. I'll do it every week. Just call me anytime. Awesome. Well, I've put in the chat our um, first Thursday book discussion again. If people want to come talk about things you save in a fire, we would love to have you. Um, Catherine, thank you so much. Stay safe, stay warm. Yeah, I yep. will. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.